Um, last time we did it from east to west. Um, should we try and do a similar movement across the country? Nev, you're in the Midlands, aren't you? Is Derby the Midlands? We... Well, I mean, I'm, I'm North Birmingham, so yeah, I'm, I'm West Midlands. West Midlands. Let's do it from yeah. north to south this time, because like, Kat, we got you. You're in Glasgow. You're our most northern member. Yay. Cool. We'll work down the country. If you're up for that, Kat, just say hello. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Hi. Do you want an introduction or? Just, yeah, quick intro where, where, where you're at with the, your composting journey and uh, who um, you are and all that. Yeah, so the, the incredible edible stuff. Uh, we're getting community gardens up and running now um, in our village and I've just been offered premises to do some like big scale composting I think but but the only the only deal is that we have to use a rocket composter in part of that so it's but yeah okay. free premises that's pretty awesome okay uh, that's that's interesting I have to hear more Does about that <laughs> Where are you, Kat? What village are you? Uh, Neilston, so it's um, it's just outside of Glasgow. Cool, thanks, Kat. I, I want to hear more about the rocket composter at the end. Nikki might know a bit more than I do about them. But yeah, nice one. All right, coming down, where are we? Um, well, as a, as a kind of a leak, I was born in Livingston, um, just outside Edinburgh and uh, moved into the Midlands when I was seven um, when my family moved down to take over a family business. So yeah, um, my memories uh, of Scotland before that was working with my dad and he used to be a YTS instructor and he taught horticulture. So yeah, that was my little intro to, to the world of, of growing and compost and that sort of thing. And now I'm in North Birmingham and I'm running a couple of community projects, uh, one being a composting one, and the other being just the general food growing and uh, gardening. And I also work with DT Derby, uh, Down to Earth Derby, on a new project, which we're also putting a compost club in, in Derby and various other projects, um, which are soon to be unveiled. We've got a showcase Tuesday of next week in Derby, if anybody would like to come. Um, and it's to announce our partnership with Eden Project and Rolls Royce. Yeah, so that's me. Brilliant. Thanks, Ned. Nice one. Um, Amy, I think it is you and Hayley now, mate. Yeah, and we're friends with Down to Earth Derby, so we hope to come next Tuesday. We need to RSVP. But um, yeah. Um, yeah, so we're in the border of Leicestershire, Northamptonshire, and Warwickshire. And uh, yeah, we work on a community supported agriculture project and we just put our compost spinner in after getting rid of our pigs um, uh, to deal with our day to day food waste. And um, we're also the trash head or the trash head, which you might have met us online. We're talking an Australian accent. It's, it's, in, it's our trash that makes us feel this way. And we spent the summer being trash heads on the festivals at the site that we we're on and bringing the waste from the people. Because at the end of the day, it's just the beginning, isn't it really? Trash is the beginning of everything. And you know, for a lot of people, they think it's the end when they put it in the bin, for, but for us, it's the beginning. So we're looking forward to hopefully getting 10,000 people's waste in one weekend and inviting you all to a compost mega mix party for maybe a week long massive compost festivity at in Leicestershire this year. Amazing. I've really struggled to not speak in an Australian accent for like the rest of the day every time I talk to Amy about composting. Um, thanks. That's great. Trash Heads United. Um, <laughs> is that your hand sign it's one of those cool we're, we're working on it we need trash heads we need the logos the branding the oh, okay uh, the yeah yeah nice um right so we've got is it who is it now peter you're in london mate are you there with us peter peter ballast that is hey man hey. good to see you 
Yeah, so I'm from Hungary, from the capital. I mean, I born and bred in the Hungarian capital here in the UK 10 years. And uh, I live in London next to the London Bridge. Um, it's uh, it's a third biggest estate on a, on a, on a, a social housing estate the third biggest estate in the SADC. And uh, there is some the gardening project around and uh, I, I, I do that. I just involved and um, and one of one of our site is an allotment. People, some reason, took food waste there, collect in a cold bin didn't work, we buried in the new raised beds. I'm looking for a new way to deal with the long term on the food waste. And that's how I I found Tom, met with Tom. He had a presentation at the Lambert, Edible Lambert, something like that. And that was very impressive and like a solution to our food waste, uh, small food waste uh, problem. Then we bought a Euro composter last spring, and uh, we bought another three this spring. Nice, man. Thank you. Yeah. When I went to install the Jura with you, I was so impressed by how much wood chip you had stored all over your garden landscapes, just everywhere it could possibly be wood chip with wood chip. Uh, one of my mania, uh, the wood chip. Uh, I have a very good experience with the wood chip uh, for multiple reasons and uh, yeah. Nice. Thanks, Peter. That's great. Peter Mack, you're here, mate. You are. Uh, you're... Oh, you're, you're putting me in Bristol, blimey. Yeah, no, I'm in Froome, near Bristol-ish. Is um, Bristol north of Froome? Marginally, yes. There you go. Good guess. Um, uh, so, um, Froome has a composting, uh, well, community interest company called um, Froome Compost. And we've now got one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, eight jurors and a rydan that we're feeding with, mostly with the, um, with food waste from businesses. Uh, from um, and, uh, and, that, and we've just built our first, what we're calling compost creation station at the medical center, uh, which is partly a demonstration uh, thing, uh, which has got two jurors. Um, up there so we're sort of ticking over and looking forward to Tom coming and visiting us at some point um, to see where we're at. Um, we're at the point we're just about to do two things one is to we've, we had a video made of our work which is about to have its world premiere uh, which we're going to invite all the people who've given us food waste um, to come to we've just got a date for that May the 12th and um, and also entered the film in a, in, a, in a green film competition which is pretty cool oh well we'll see what happens. Um, so that's happened. And also we've got our first product about to emerge, I think. I think it's sat long enough maturing and uh, we're going to have to get it out and actually put it in some buckets. First thing we're going to do is actually give some back to the people who gave us the food waste. So that's coming up. I think I have to do. Brilliant. Nice one, Peter. Thanks so much. And, um, and then Bristol. Lucas, do you want to say hello, mate? Hello, mate. Yay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to talk in a minute, so yeah, I can, I can we'll save that for that then. Yeah, cool. No worries. Nikki. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm Nikki. Um, uh, what, what can I say? <clears throat> I've got the um, I've been just been reemployed by Devon to uh, do the state of the uh, Devon Community Composting Network. Um, because they made me redundant a few years ago, so we lost touch. But actually, I'm amazed to find there's lots of projects still going, and I'm reconnecting with lots of them, and there's lots of new ones. And I've also uh, just recently been in touch with the Big Hannah people, because there are four schools in Devon that have got Big Hannahs, which are big, um, you know, mechanical composters, a bit like the rocket kind of idea. Um, but the company went bust, and they've been taken over by a company in Spain, um, but their engineers are based in Northern Ireland. So I'm, I'm on a sort of complicated quest to get the engineers over to uh, refurbish and um, get these composters going again at, at these community colleges. 
and there's a whole new wave of people that are, are like yourselves that are getting really getting into compost again now and and on that front as you know tom we've got the composting in the community networks which i urge you if you haven't joined us at composting in the community please do join up because we're trying to network the whole whole country at the moment uh, yeah. and you know and and beyond hopefully so yeah exciting times for composting again definitely thanks nikki that's brilliant yeah composting the community network is really cool everyone um there'll be a lot more to to, to come from that um yeah uh great well i won't uh, talk very long um i'm really excited i'm going to share some slides with you about um this mycelium network uh for composting and what i hope it can do hope it sort of the, the, the motivations behind it and um yeah and then we're going to hear from nev um which i'm really excited about in um yeah maybe around 8 30. so let's start what are you laughing at Haley? <laughs> let's start with um let's start by going to lucas who's just going to share with us about um about about uh, unearthed which is the project that uh that he started uk-wide um changing the relationships between people and land and uh also a cool event he wants to do in bristol lucas you are you are you ready mate yeah i am thanks mate um hello everyone um so so yeah i i've been kind of exploring soil for the last sort of two years during lockdown on my allotment and um i got a national lottery community fund last year to create a uk-wide tour a project called unearthed where we are using collective imagination we're using storytelling to work with rural communities to imagine what our future relationship to land might be like in the future um this is a uh, a kind of pilot an experiment we're using kind of different methods to engage people and really think beyond the status quo about what our future relationship of land might be like um we are six workshops into the tour we, we've kind of been in par in cornwall we've been to willowbrook farm in oxfordshire which is the uk's first halal farm um We've been to Wrexham, lots of places across um, the UK so far, and then we're heading over to Northern Ireland next week. Then we're going up through Scotland um, to work with Transition Town Forres, um, Dunbar, but then we're going to the Outer Hebrides. Um, and so far, um, because it's been an exploration, we, um, we don't go in the agenda to these communities. We really want to kind of open up conversations and use imagination to really think beyond what what is possible and, and also what might be possible and how we might get there um so there's lots of different threads coming through the different locations even though they're kind of locally rooted the concerns and challenges there's a lot that's coming up in terms of local food security um kind of repurposing um abandoned buildings into multi-purpose centers for for sharing food for growing food for sharing knowledge um, so there's there's that at the moment which I'm doing, um, and it's really opening up a conversation around what land means to people beyond kind of land use as we see it, but also what it means to us and in a kind of spiritual way as well, and what it means to us, kind of you know our ancestral wisdom, our connection to landscape, and what that does to our sort of mental and physical well-being. Um, we're working on a on a community level, so on the ground. Um, working with people and creating space for for farmers, for um, land work, other land workers, from people just you know running shot down the road or to be in a room together. Um, and it's it's kind of not um, a lot of the communities that we've spoken to so far are are kind of open to it, but they've always kind of been in citizenship consultations where there's normally sort of an old guy at the front kind of having an agenda where this is quite exploratory and, and it takes a little while for them to sort of open up and engage but some of the stuff that's coming out is really quite hopeful and like easily achievable if if we were allowed to do these things um so we're just trying to build the sort of power of that um and we'll we'll share more soon we're creating a green print um so we'll we'll share more when we've kind of reflected on the tour a little bit more and kind of find the threads between each community um 
And we're also going to start working with some systems designers and things like that to bring in the kind of next stage of like sort of systems thinking and kind of policy in that as well. But um, at the moment, we're just kind of connecting um, and we see this work as like a mycelium web. So we are building a network and we're kind of thinking about how we share just, um, share resources. We we explore, we support the network. And um, so that's that's the kind of social art engagement projects that's happening but um there's a project so before that i was doing a residency at watershed in bristol and i was exploring um our relationship to soil um i was sticking hydrophones and geophones in the ground and i was recording the sounds of soil um which was coming up with some mad crazy sounds it was like tuning into some alien signals um but it is now um and i'm up for sharing some of those if you want access to them i mean yeah <laughs> um but there's there's some really interesting stuff coming from that in terms of how so for example um how trees have cavitation clicks there you go you got a hydrophone yes love it get that in your compost bin yeah yeah, yeah great um and there's some really interesting things because because the the study as you all know um the study of sort of soil um, from a sort of soil um, sort of scientist perspective is that you have to take the soil away to take it to a lab to then analyze it but actually you know sticking a microphone in the ground means you can kind of like have a sort of step is it stethoscope yeah. yeah on the soil so you're hearing the kind of living breathing world you're hearing the the worms you know do what they do you're hearing the ants scatter around you're hearing you know water seeping through the wind for the trees goes through the roots so there's all of these things that it's quite weird and wonderful, but it, it's a it's a way of kind of engaging people into that world. Um, and also for people, I was on the allotment and people kind of go, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just listening to my soil, you know? And they're like, what? <laughs> okay. And then you kind of open up that conversation and it, it kind of makes it a bit more playful that it's not this kind of alien world or it's not seen as dirt or anything like that. It opens up a conversation where it's actually alive. Like, and, and, you know, a lot of soil scientists that have approached me from Austria and Canada, they kind of want to use these methods to sort of start mapping the biodiversity in the soil, soil health in a more um, in a more friendly way that they're not extracting it from its location. So there's huge potential for that. Um, I've, I've kind of taken a step back a little bit from that because of the National Lottery Project that came about, um, which is great but there's still a burning desire to start recording um, and doing more with that. But um, so one of the things I'm, I'm looking to do in later on this year, maybe summer, is in Bristol, I'd like to create like a soil jam. So I am a good friend with an artist and musician, amazing musician called Emily Magpie. Um, she does a lot of weird and wonderful stuff with nature sounds and, and does a lot of stuff with simps. And I wanna create an event um, potentially in Bristol where there's a, a, an opportunity, a day event, an evening event to have like a knowledge exchange. <laughs> I love the, uh, the dancing going on here. Um, a knowledge exchange in Bristol where there's kind of workshops, there's talks to engage people in conversations around soil and what it means for our health, what it means for our foods. Um, and there'll be a kind of sharing of food. Um, and in the evening, then Emily will play and do a live kind of jam with the soil that's in that landscape um so it will be yeah that's what i'm hoping to do it's been in my mind for a little while i spoke to emily the other day and she's up for it but i am open to suggestions of what sort of talks or what sort of things you know you potentially think could work really well in an environment um to people that might not have engaged with soil don't really have access to a space to grow or anything like that to, to try and open up that conversation so that's where I'm going to stop for a minute and then open up chat, really. Thanks so much, Lucas, man. That's amazing. Right. I love it. I love what you're doing with sort of soil and social change through like the senses, right. basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I just want to quickly uh, welcome my friend Max as well. Um, Max is joining us. He's, hey, he's the reason I actually know Lucas. So I'm always super yeah. grateful to Max. And um, yeah. He's uh, the most incredible photographer. Um, yeah. I cannot tell you if, it, if, if people haven't seen All Things Fungi on Instagram, this is Max. He's like becoming one of the most knowledgeable mushroom people 
in the UK has sort of dedicated his life to fungi and has more f- fungi friends on the internet than I could possibly conceive of being possible. But all over the world, Max is friends with fungi people now because of, of shared appreciation from his photos. So yeah, do you want to say hi, Max? Hey. Um, yeah, I don't know how I follow that. That was a bit of a big intro. Um, yeah, I'm just a mushroom enthusiast. Um, I haven't really got a title, amateur mycologist, citizen scientist, I don't really know, but primarily just a, a mushroom photographer that uh, specializes in macro subjects. So tiny fungi, mix in my seats. Um, I grow various mushrooms at home, take part in ecological surveys around Sussex with a local group. Um, and I'm also contributing to the Darwin Tree of Life project at Kew Gardens with a couple of species that I've found. Um, yeah, I j- it's just an obsession, really. I, I don't, I don't really know what else to say. It's kind of one of those things that once you realise how integral they are to life, it's um, nothing else matters really. So that's where I'm at with it. Um, been a supporter of Compost Club since the beginning. Uh, in my opinion, I think if you're a, into mushrooms and you're not into soil health then you're kind of doing it wrong so um yeah that's me um i'm not sure what the future holds who knows i'm trying to identify as many species as possible i'm hoping to find something new to science that's the dream um yeah so that's about it happy to be here happy to be involved nice to meet you all thanks max i saw you were doing dna sequencing recently dude like- yeah yeah well I'm hoping to do more of that. I've got a meeting on Monday at Q and um So is is I'm, that how you find out if you find a new strain? You have to DNA sequence it. Yeah, yeah, you'd have to sequence it and upload it to um to one of the, the blast um hosting websites. And then yeah, if you see matches, great. If not, then you might have something new. But um yeah, Amazing. at the moment. And oh, I'd love it if you could share about your your pet slime mold. That's so cool. He found a slime mold on a stick, and he's been growing it in like this labyrinth around his house, around his. Uh... It's right here, if you want to see. I don't know yeah, yeah. Show us that. your slime, slime, and it's called slime and the slime mold. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, that's slime. Not quite sure what species it is yet. But... Wait, 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 wait. We have to talk. Wait, we while didn't, you show it. We didn't get to see you it properly. Talk. Yes, please. <laughs> You have to keep talking. While how did you do it, Max? Yeah, Just how did you do it? You see that? Yeah, but you have to keep Everyone talking to see it. Well, yeah, that's it. I, I've got a feeling that it's um, a fissarum, only because the colour of it and the location that I found it, I found a a, um, a plasmodium. It's in a plasmodium stage at the moment, so it's feeding. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I can't figure out exactly what it is until it fruits, but. I was just lucky enough to find a stick which had um, a sclerotia in, which is the dormant stage of a slime mold. And then once you introduce it to um, moist conditions, it sort of comes back to life and starts feeding again. But um, I mean, I think I'm going to talk in June a little bit more in depth about it with you guys. But yeah. anyone could do that if you just collect leaf litter, bark. I mean, mix of my seats are everywhere. Um, their spores like get blown around so if you introduce some organic material even compost it's you know it's in compost Um, yeah you see flagellates under the microscope amoeba that's like you know beginning of slime mold so yeah if you collected some bark leaf litter stick you're saying that flagellates flagellates and amoeba but they're protozoans well the two two flagellates will combine to create the zygote and then turn to slime mold what? So I mean, I think there's more. There's a lot more to them um, uh, than we give them credit for, especially in soil health yeah. and things like that. You know, they're they're in there. They're doing stuff. And we don't really fully understand what they're up to, but you know, they're they're ancient. So yeah, it's fascinating. So that is so yeah, amazing. I'm at, and I've got two or three different species here at the moment that are growing and feeding. And I'm just monitoring them, just playing, really. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a scientist. I'm an artist. I'm a photographer. But I've just got an unhealthy obsession with these things and just playing around and seeing what happens. But, um, yeah, there's plenty more to discover with slime molds, for sure. Nice. You're very humble as well, like the, like the good humus that we are. <laughs> um, cheers, Max. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Right, that's great. I've got 10 minutes, which is about right. And then we want to introduce Nev. I'm going to try and screen share with you guys. Um, can you see the talk now? One sec. All right. <sighs> Excuse me. Come up. Yeah. Oh, that's my mouse. And my computer is playing up a bit. Sorry, guys. I've, uh... oh, where's my mouse gone? I can't see it. <laughs> there we go. Right. Okay. All right. I've got a few things to share with you guys. Um, all right. Here's some big, th big ideas that um, for me, I think about every, all the time and I, trying to sort of like achieve I guess work towards it's like these are like the sort of big horizons that sort of you know um I, I see this as being about um so it's like imagine this I'd like a, a compost revolution that's sort of changed our culture and that uh, could 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 be in, informed by by fungi which is you know clearly one of the most intelligent organisms on the planet um so yeah it's about like mimicking not just fungi but all natural systems and how do we take what they're doing in nature into our social and economic worlds which are so broken and just falling apart so quickly um and i've been kind of mostly inspired by this soil food web as well as like other soil and mycological um sort of uh profits of our time um and learning about how we can actually produce something that's so valuable everywhere it's about the microorganisms in it and the inputs that we use it's like totally replicable to do on a small a relatively small scale everywhere and that means that it's worth doing because it can be so valuable so much more valuable than we ever knew compost could be um and just like the mycorrhizal network in the forest that enables you know the biggest most successful ecosystems on the land to exist we can use the internet to share information and eliminate all the waste in the in the network uh, and i guess on a sort of social level this is about cultivating relationships to build a different regenerative culture um, and helping landscapes to heal bioregionally so not sort of saying you know like the mainstream climate or um, environmental narratives just like just got to do this or we've just got to plant trees we've just got to it's not about that it's about working with landscapes and and the native plants and the native, native fungi and flora um and i guess we can all do that you know our all of our composts will be different they will always contain the native microorganisms to our area um, and we should celebrate that and not try and standardize or uh, conform them. We just need to get them, get our composts and our soils to be, uh, you know, a maximum diversity to uh, as possible. Uh, and in the, on the way, you can reconnect people to land and places. We can make amazing compost stations that give people, you know, places they want to go and communities they can be part of again. And, um, and, and also this is about this is about put, take reclaiming the narrative around carbon and making it something that people everyone can do because they own the carbon they are the carbon they 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 they, they, put, they can store the carbon in the soil and that has hugely uh, a huge Im impact that's currently completely not measured i think it's to totally possible to measure it but uh you know i think that's going to require a lot of people um sort of singing from the same hymn sheet and changing the dialogue around what is happening with our climate breakdown and um so yeah i'd like to talk about that and then also with this compost club collection thing which sort of took off you know in lockdown we we started being paid to take people's food waste got, got paid to make compost and i think that's something that we're replicating through this network and we can replicate a lot more and i'd like to talk about ways we can make that more uh, sustainable 
and um, viable kind of long term. So I've got a really exciting thing to share. In the next slide, I've got um, I've got our first report. We used um, so okay on the soil food web. They teach you that true compost. They call it complete compost or biologically complete compost. Um, but it contains at least 70,000 different species of bacteria and 25,000 different species of fungi. And in one gram of material, you will have billions and billions of bacteria and meters and meters of fungi in one gram, like, you know, a fifth of a teaspoon, as well as up to a million protozoa, 10,000 microarthropods, 1,000 nematodes per gram. And nematodes are like the top predators and you could have a thousand of them in a gram it's just like absolutely mind-blowing so in like one of the 25 liter buckets of compost that i've sold there are 25 is it million or anyway um we'll leave the mass to you but a lot of nematodes um so it's worth it the compost is worth it and we've got to be able to sort of sell it and supply it and meet the needs of the, the land and the farmers to to get the get the carbon and these organisms back in the earth um because obviously we're in the middle of a climate breakdown and hopefully it's not the middle hopefully we can still tip it the other way but the only way we'll be able to tip it the other way is by is by following that you know that that logic i think that it's the one thing everyone can do everyone can make some this is a graphic by nev um, which I thought was really helpful, um, which explains what SOM is, it's soil organic matter. That is what true compost is. And that is what, well, it's actually what, it's our version of complete, of, of, of soil organic matter that we can make and install back into the earth to become soil organic matter. Um, but the, the most powerful thing about it is not just that it's 50% carbon because it's rich in fungi and all of these humic compounds, which are stable cut forms of carbon, but also because it creates cooling. Like we haven't properly appreciated this, but you know, one gram of, of carbon stores seven grams of water in the soil. It's a, it creates this sponge. And the more water's in the soil, the slower evaporation happens, the cooler local climates become that shape larger climates. And obviously the largest carbon store is the soil. And as Nev's graphic shows, there could be we there's it's almost unlimited how much more carbon we can store in the soil you know it's hard to get a one percent increase it takes years but we can do it with uh, cover crops and with compost and and that's what's happening it's what's going to happen and it's happening across the world and it's really inspiring so we need a human mycelium network to spread fungi because the compost is almost just like the transportation vehicles that like habitat for the fungi the way that it can be installed back into the soil that we've uh, removed it from um, so here is a test that i got done um, by a friend perry who i'll invite in the future to the to the group he's um he's another one of these sort of soil food web disciples had his life changed by the um soil food web and the understanding it gives you and um he's been really kind to do this test for me on our compost so this is compost that i i made with joraform stuff and uh that was so it's 50 hot compost with the jurors with which is 50 percent food waste input and then i've also added 10 percent biochar and uh about maybe 10 15 percent or even of uh of, of leaf mold from a nearby ancient oak woodland which i thought that's going to be full of fungi so my goal with this was to try and get the fungi up and you can see i'll just try and explain this to you guys a little bit of all the things i've got the fungi is the thing I've been least successful at. Um, it's that's actually a really low ratio of fungi to bacteria. It's like it's not even 0 0.01 of uh, fungi to bacteria ratio. And it's meant to be if you can get one to one, you've got a really good compost that's capable of growing all of the vegetables and all of the food for humans. But as it is that apparently that is saying that it will only grow that, that, that it will only it will it will select for weeds that according to this chart which i could show you guys um that's saying it's it will select for weeds however i've got one and a half million protozoa per gram 
which is like absolutely amazing. And I've also got um, really good, well, I think pretty good numbers of nematodes, 200 nematodes per gram. Sounds like, anyway, I know the compost is really good because I've seen it, I've used it in growing and it's, and lots of people have said it, it it's really helped their, their plants. So I'm not too worried. Apparently the experts say that, yeah, there are certain things you need to, basically fungi takes time and there are certain foods that you need to add to get your fungi up to really get the holy grail of compost. And they include things that like are carnivorous, like, like fish hydrosylate and um, things like that, which I'm really interested in. Apparently, you can also use certain mushroom, um, spent mushroom strains like King Strafaria mushrooms. They have been told that they will help you speed up the metabolization of fungi. And I'm, I'm sure um, Lucas, um, I'm sure Nev can share some um insights into this as well but yeah um any questions about this at the end like i'd love to answer them because i'm i'm obviously just starting to get an understanding i have i do have composting pile of wood chips and i take uh take take the fungi like that and uh put it onto the papers uh put it on to put it into the compost um which you know that idea of like the slime mold feeding feeding the fungi the compost um to try and get its numbers up so I think that's something that that does work, but there's uh, there's just something um, else I've got to learn to get the fungi up. Um, but um, I guess a bigger motivating idea is this idea of can we team up uh, in our neighbourhoods, in our community gardens, with our relationships to different farmers and regions of the country, and make a complete compost that is, um, you know like to a formula almost so that we can create it in, in all of these different regions and supply it locally together. So whoever makes the compost gets the money, but it could be supplied through a network. So, because what I've learned is that this thing, like the, the compost club idea is all well and good, but 50% of the money is um, in compost is moving it. And that is always going to be the case. It's heavy. Moving organic matter is super heavy and, uh, and hard work. And, you know, that's what farmers will always say is just like, you know, yeah, you can do, you can farm without fossil fuels, but you need fossil fuels to move compost kind of thing. So, um, we do need to make local compost and we need to make it to, for that to work for all of this degraded farmland. We need to make it everywhere. And um, Nikki's, you know, this is, I'm sure, you know, speaking exactly um, from Nikki's sort of script here, but um, this is an example of farming, um, the current farming system. So, okay, I'm just going to share quickly because I want to move on to Nev, but uh, I'm starting, I'm, I'm writing a course at the moment and it's it's called Composting to Heal the Earth. And it's, it's basically going to be full of everything all of the practical composting stuff that i've learned um and i want i want to share with a kind of like um narrative of why everything matters and why to compost so to try and sort of like install a bit more motivation into people when they're dealing with all of these all these organic materials that they, they don't think very much of and part of it is um we got a bit of funding and we've got a, we've got 100 copies of this course to give to people that would otherwise not be able to afford it um and so i think those are going to be young people so people in schools and farmers so i'd love to um you know i'm going to share the course with you guys um as members but i'd love to uh kind of crowdsource that a bit open like uh if you could help me get the course to the to, to to into the hands of people who it would have a good influence on because like you know this is a picture i took of the field in sussex recently farmers are in this downward cycle that's been caught inflicted on them by the uh, you know the agricultural industry which is farm this way to in order to compete and stay alive and as a result the, the plants are working against them like that's a that's a field which they've tilled before it's got no fungi so there's no organic matter there's no nutrient cycling the corn don't go anywhere all year and then they get docks because docks are the plants that come to break up compacted soils so the next year they have to dig deeper and they have to till harder and the farmers are destroying the land and they're destroying the climate which, uh, which is a tragedy and they don't want to do that they just don't know they didn't know what they were doing by taking out the fungi with, with excessive tilling. And so it's kind of interventions with farmers is something I'd love to talk about with you guys and uh, 
and help them to to restore their their soil ecosystems um, together. So, and then also the other aspect is is, is schools, um, and you know, it, uh, it's going to be them that have the potential to really do all of this work uh, that needs to be done. So uh, it would be good to um, be good to sh share about that. Um, and um, I can um, I do think that compost tumblers in schools are a really good thing. And we should team up to um, try and install as many of them as, as possible. Um, and I'm in favour of all, all compost tumblers and other and 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 innovative community composting design. So um, that I'd like all of that to be open sourced through the network, um, whatever it grows into. So yeah, um, that's 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 all I had really. That's a I think it's about just increasing the number of people we can get involved in in this. The, you know, the founder of permaculture said if we can get um, if we could just get ten percent of people to just go from just consumption to production on a small scale, even if there were just ten percent of people doing that, there would be enough food. Um, you know, and I think that that is. That is something that's totally possible with composting. I think we can get we can get 10% more people composting and giving back to the land. And that's really exciting and something that uh, yeah, it's it's be um amazing to uh to take forward with you guys. So uh I hope you enjoyed my 10 slides. I went on a little bit too long, sorry about that. But beautiful, yeah. beautiful, Woo -woo. cool. <laughs> Thanks a lot nice one all right nev you're on mate are you still there still here. i'm still here can you hear me i can hear you man yeah brilliant awesome so yeah that's the slideshow that i should have made and basically kind of sums out my my, my latest kind of journey into into um society and community uh, and people in general um so yeah i mean obviously the audience is uh, is very well uh, well versed, um, and that is kind of the point of what we're doing at the minute with DT is that um, we feel that we're at a time when everybody is quite well versed in in this area, and I, I don't I don't mean sort of soil science or specifics in general. I just mean with the the general state of climate and the problem that we're in. Um, so yeah, I think it's like everybody. Everybody knows you can talk to pretty much anyone now, and they'll be like, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." No, it is. It's it's something we need to sort out. Um, yeah, and that's kind of where the conversation finishes. And and it's um, it's wicked being around people like you. I've already heard like three things tonight that's absolutely blown my mind completely. Um, yeah, I can't I can't believe that about slow mold. It's absolutely blown my mind. I was still thinking about it, and I was like, oh. So when they said it wasn't fungi and it was something else, and I was thinking, well, what's the something else? Well, they, they, I can't believe that either. That is completely. That's like you know that that thing about lichen and that realization that lichen's like okay, it's a plant and it's a bacteria and it's a yeah. fungi, and and we call it one thing. But now you're telling us that protozoa are basically slime molds. Uh, <laughs> Symbiosis yeah. is amazing. It's amazing. It's absolutely anyway. amazing. Um, Dude, yeah. Nev, I'd love to hear about your compost, your, your the compost club you're setting up more because that's so exciting. And you've just got two massive ride ends. And you know, I, I I've I've learned a lot from you just from following your Instagram. So please just like yeah. don't don't hold back. Just tell us about soil, Nev. Tell us. Cool. And um, well, to be honest, it's kind of it's kind of the same way back. I think there's a bromance impending because I've always looked at your stuff and thought, yeah, that's exactly what I need to be doing. That's uh, that's my man. Um, but yeah, soil soils become um, an obsession as it seems to be with 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 people once they get in it. Um, I'm not massively uh, versed in the technical side of things, and there's obviously people here that have been at this game for. A lot, lot longer than than uh, probably me and you combined. So, but yeah, it's um, it's really good. It's really exciting. And as Nikki said, there's definitely a movement towards people actually looking at compost and thinking, oh, it's not just a thing that Granddad does. This this might actually be a key. Um, 
and I think that is also a part of everybody just kind of getting fed up of the, the, the big tech, the big tech movement of the world in general and thinking it's just not, we can't fix the problem with the thing that caused the problem. So yeah, it's a um, good realisation. But yeah, in Warsaw, we've, um, we, we've started working on a few allotment sites initially um, and uh, mixed responses from what we wanted to do because we wanted to bring people that weren't necessarily a uh, allotment holder onto site and we wanted to have children about which were noisy and we wanted to hold sort of workshops which was a um, an inconvenience for a lot of people so we've met varied responses and over the last five or six years we've um, had to kind of navigate through community community spaces to try and find somewhere that, that was our feet but the the Winterley Lane where I mostly work at the minute um that was completely refreshing change Felix sorry my dog's just had a drink and now he's deciding he has to gamble around the room to get dry um uh what was I saying yeah this was a, a completely different story when I got into this um site and the management just changed as I came on the old manager showed me around and he was like you can't have wood chip because it makes the soil sick and you, it, it was just a big list of things that were completely so left field to me and so so flummoxing but I went through the process and got onto a plot and then he that guy had a heart attack and there was no manager and nobody was interested in being the manager of the site. Everybody was quite happy to come down, but as for actually doing anything for somebody else, it was kind of out of the question. So me and Malcolm, um, an older guy who um, um, is just generally available and had time and, and, and um, the, the resource to be around, we took it on together and then we just basically did what we want from that point in. So that was good. We had we took over all the empty plots that were on site. We've uh, we've made one into a, a like a perennial kind of food forest. We did the first planting um, last year, and we're carrying that on this year. And before that, we did two seasons of cover crop on it, and um, to try and repair what had happened previously. Obviously, these things that just allotments are like, what? Not a chance. Not a chance. So yeah, we kind of got to do a lot of things that you wouldn't normally get to do, um, and that's been a great a great journey of being able to try these things without having any land or access to any sort of um, size of land. We still managed to try out these crazy little bits and bobs. So yeah, that's that's us up to up to current state. We we got um, sorry guys. We got um um a lottery awards for all and put a kitchen and a apiary and a, a polytunnel and then we've just uh, reapplied for that and we got it again and this is where we've got the riddance from so yeah it's it's uh it's it's early stages for us um literally haven't done half as much as as you have but it's really exciting and although I, i'm very much a, just a composting in place kind of person i i prefer to compost on the ground and i prefer to have minimal infrastructure i think as a tool to bring to communities and as a as a way of of showing how it can be done and it and, and it can not be a rat infested process etc uh, which i'm quite happy with but um yeah most people have an aversion to them um, um it's it's a really good tool it's really effective and already we've been using we've used it for three weeks but it's it churns out some compost for such little work it's brilliant it really is it really is good is, have you got any pictures of your big ride and an action for us, Nev? I um, haven't, to be honest. I haven't. I should have. I haven't. I did actually take some footage today, some nice, smoky, steamy footage, but I haven't had a chance to, no to get it anywhere that, that can be viewable. Um, I will do. I will post them up, though. Um, so, yeah, it's early days for us, but we, we're trying to do... We're doing quite a... Um, I suppose it's, it's not a very... It's not a very... Um, I'm trying to how to put it. We're, we're adding quite a few amendments, so it's not really sort of use what you've got around you and 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 make the best of it. We're we're trying to sort of check a few boxes. So when we're talking to the council, we've got some data and we've got some sort of. Uh, uh, it, it's really hard when you're talking to councils. When you're talking to the to the to the corporate sector, they just want to see 
that you're consuming something to make something. It's like the, the thought that you can make something from nothing is so alien to them that they don't, that it doesn't really compute. Whereas if you can put on a spreadsheet that what we could do with some uh, basalt or some rock dust and we could do with some kelp and we could do with some a few inputs and some microbial inputs. It's like, okay, so there's my in and there's my out. And all of a sudden it seems to be, okay. So we're finding these small little tricks that, that seem to me completely bonkers, but are actually working when you've got to speak the language of the councils and so is that why you're talking about all of these inputs and stuff not because you would otherwise because it, is it to, to to help yeah help help with your um, it's it's a narrative and um, but also I, I, my aim is to grow nutrient dense superfood essentially and i think every every bit of vegetable that comes out of the ground is a superfood if if it's had the chance to be one um so yeah, sort of researching that has been good for multi multiple reasons. It's been good for, for a sort of scientific backdrop to what we're trying to propose to people, but also it's good for actually testing these things and testing with bricks meters and, and looking what a, a properly balanced nutrient profile can do for your vegetables and for pest resistance and for all the sort of these things that um, in the first few years, we were struggling with just because, you know, we were using land that that we'd just taken over stewardship of and and um, there was deficiencies there. And I, I think that just a, a half decent old school soil test and a few observational things you can you can rectify these things. But the, a, a lot of the people that I was around at the time were just like, it's time. So we can build these things over time. And I totally get that um, that approach. Over time, you'll correct any deficiencies if you just keep putting good compost into the ground. Um, but we're just trying to sort of quick step that one um, by adding bits and bobs. So yeah, I'm not sure what, what your thoughts are about, about amendments. I don't see you using too many amendments. In your I'm work. really interested in what, what you said about like paramagnetism of, uh, can, you say, yeah. can you say something about that? I like, and also the thing you said about clay, because this is really interesting. You know, climate compost. Have you worked with them at all? Or yeah, no, but, I haven't. It's great. I'm, but I'm they've exploded, anything. and they're like, it's all about climate compost now. And but then um, yeah. other people. Um, one of um, there's. I've heard. I've heard a criticism that it's not as bio live, as not yeah. as biodiversity full uh, as as some of as as what compost should be. Um, yeah however yeah. it you know it's and it, it also contains some clay which like actually i've been reading i've read in a few books that and and, and from your i've heard from yourself that clay is one thing that actually has special powers in compost yeah totally i think i think when we pinpoint these specific things um and we hone in on them it, it's good because it gives us it gives us the wow moment of okay i can see how that that works but i mean obviously if you're using any kind of soil additive even a few spades full of soil you're going to have clay going into your your mix and obviously when it mixes with the ground that's what your soil's made up of is clay and sand and silt so it's going to it's going to get there eventually but yeah the, the the clay thing often is a problem especially when you know dig if you just i mean not no dig but if you just use mulch if you mulch the ground rather than, than dig stuff in you you've definitely got your horizons which are different and your, your A horizon is going to be different from your, your, your topsoil layer and your subsoil layer. And, and when we're constantly just putting compost on the ground, we can sometimes miss, especially with annual crops, when you're in and out, you, you're only getting so, you know, your depth is only going to go so, so low. And then you're reapplying again. So, yeah, your last year's microbial worm and activity has mixed it. But again, you're just putting a, a, another mix on top. So I think um, sometimes adding these these things will quicken up the process. And that's all we're trying to do, right? Constantly, we're trying to step a few steps ahead because we haven't got time to, for the forest to grow and for the forest to naturally do what it needs to do and for the, the forest to come to the pasture. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I have got a few stats which kind of line up with what you were saying. Um, and there was one point, um, I don't know, this and it was about the organic matter in the ground and how quickly we can 
create soil organic matter. Um, and something I learned a couple of weeks back was a lot about the biology hitting the ground. Um, it's not actually, you know, we think cover crops and we think actual organic matter growing and dropping and roots being organic matter in the ground and that adding to your to the humus. But um, this one here, let's have a little look. Are you going to share a, share some share a thing with us, Neb? Do you want to screen share? Yeah, go on. I might as well. It's, this is this is really simple and probably won't want to see the majority of it, but. There's a few nice little pieces in here that are interesting. Uh, mm. Hold on. I made you host, Nev, so you can share with us. Awesome. Um, so. Let me just get back to the top here. So these are all bits and bobs I've been presenting to um, to uh, allotment committees and to schools and to the council a lot. Um, so but yeah, this was one research that that I, I read the the white paper and it was um, Graham Say. I don't know if you've heard of Graham Say, but he's an um, Australian guy. Um, and he, he's got a, a good position because he's kind of, he, he, he talks to the big ag crowd and he's, he's got a very big company that produces microbial inputs and, and compost and inoculums and different sorts of stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it's nice to hear someone that can sort of speak to the, the different audiences. But yeah, when you look at this, this was, the, the, I can send you the, the white paper for this one, but one ton of compost applied over three years to multiple um, sites across two different states and they applied the compost so if you if you actually looked at the organic matter it was 0.15 percent they actually put onto the ground but then within three years they raised the organic matter by 1.35 percent so it's actually nine times what was initially applied so you, you, you're like how can i put so much so much carbon on the ground and all of a sudden i've actually got nine times that in three years and that's not by cover crops just sort of you know i mean obviously it wasn't even cover crop this is actually in production so it, it's all about it's all about fungi in the end it was all about that that the microbial biodiversity was being increased um it was about the bacteria it was about the the actual filaments and the uh the fungal filaments were actually adding to the organic matter so when when you talk you know when we talk about things being proven by by science or we need the proof or we need the the, the peer research it's kind of already there and, and that's what happens when you look around a lot you're finding that most things are actually proven and it's not really about proving anything um and as many stats and as many sort of ways to explain it you can come up with but it is already there and it is ready to be adopted and um maybe the time's just right maybe it's uh Maybe this war and the and the, the phosphorus and the nitrogen prices and the you know we simply cannot keep producing food as we do it, like not not in the next ten years like like next next season is the is the issue for a lot of farmers so yeah it's um I think all the information is there generally and we need to it's all about interfacing um like you said in your your um. Your slideshow it's about interfacing with people it's about interfacing with farmers um but i don't know have you seen groundswell tom have you if you looked at, at what groundswell does i haven't been to groundswell now but i'd love to go and i know it's like gone it's gone sort of up and up hasn't it since it started yeah, yeah. five years so, ago maybe and every year it's sort of doubling in size which is yeah. really exciting um but yeah have you been could you tell us a bit about it i haven't been oh, what i need to go and that was kind of it was kind of um, I mentioned it purely because it's it's when you when you think that the state of things is really bad and you think big ag are not listening to what what needs to be done and and I think they are I just think everything that is interwoven into the economy has such a a slow response time um, in comparison to to what we need to do um, the economy is like the ultimate backstop isn't it it's the ultimate 
get out of uh, of why we're doing what we're doing. But yeah, that one's that one's amazing. If, if if when you're looking at solutions generally for for the world, if within three years you can you can raise organic matter by one point three five percent. There we go. Um, but yeah, the, the, again, these are these are slides that I'm I'm using to sort of try and speak to people in plain English. Um, and, and a lot of people are talking about climate anxiety and like especially like the college students that we spoke to. It seems to be a, an age where they, they've got understanding and feel responsibility. Um, and, and these guys really, really don't know what to do. So this is what I think the power of Compost Club is. It's an it's a instant way of easing your anxiety should we say <laughs> it's an instant way of capturing carbon and the whole talk around carbon and the whole hype over carbon and, and the fact that we've you know it looks like it could possibly derail the actual solutions because we're so transfixed on carbon and carbon footprints and carbon credits um i think we're just going to have to roll with that now because it's so integrated within within the 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 policies that have now been written for the next 10 and 20 years and the language surrounding all of that so i'm finding it a really really good good thing to talk about generally and to be to telling people in, in layman's terms you can actually store carbon in your own back garden and it's it's um it's scalable and it's replicable and you can measure it yeah how do you measure it nev because um i i've been asked that before and i i, I all i know about is some YouTube videos I've seen where people are like burning it, they're burning it yeah. and yeah, in a controlled so, way. And then they're proving yeah. that that's, can you explain yeah, that? Burning, burning and weight test. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a weight test. I think essentially, I don't know if, um, if Nikki knows more on that, but basically we're working with, with Derby university um, and in Birmingham at the USC and they're doing tests for us. So yeah, a lot of this stuff, it's just kind of knowing the right people to to help you out um but um we're going to do we're doing it both in Warsaw and in Darbury. we're going to do some control tests so so we will we will get some data for that because yeah um, the, the the composting in the community network guys um and i did a little presentation to them and they they fed back really helpfully that yeah, yeah basically the thing that gives this all of this work the edge right now is the carbon yeah. storage yeah totally you know it is it's just half of the he's just half of the story obviously but yeah. um it's better than none of the story um and you know it's carbon cycling in general is is only going to uh, slow down if we, we change our ways but yeah preaching to the converted is absolutely uh it's about getting that message to those um but yeah i mean these are all, all stuff that we know about but it's it's really nice to be able to to look at look at them and explain them to people um, and certain audiences respond better to certain stuff the the older kind of engineer guys love the stuff about anions and cations um, but that was um, um, basically the the last bit on this slide if you look at the bottom line um, nitrate sulfur and boron can only store on humus so like it just that fact alone is is pretty incredible and the fact that that big ag will put will pay top dollar and put all of those three um additives on the fields and literally are losing three quarters of it within a week of it being applied oh. and, it, and it, um, it it's not only a waste of money and it's not only pointless it's it's where it goes to that's the issue isn't it it's where all that leaches to and around here we've got a, a around birmingham we've got a, a nice canal system but you can see the guys applicating on the fields and with a week you can see the response in the canal and it's just red it was green first then it turns to brown then it goes to quite bright red and then it seems to dissipate after that but that will happen you know that'll happen twice a year pretty much it's criminal like, what yeah, how how can it still be happening yeah totally but but the kind of going back to the groundswell thing seeing that many people going through that that and 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 talking to um 
um, different guys that have been different farmers that are in the local area. And, you know, they're like, this is going to change everything, quite literally, because they can't keep the information from farmers forever, that this is not only cheaper and, and better, it's, it's going to save the day. And yeah. there's a consensus generally now in the scientific community, uh, community that farmers will be the people to save the day, pretty much. Yeah. It's um or in the like in the kind of capitalist jargon speak, microbiology is the most disruptive technology. Um, yeah. I like that. Yeah, you know, that, it's, it's totally right, completely right. But yeah, so that that was yeah, so that was the carry on from that. So that's just some common cations and common common anions that that without humus in the soil, you you don't have full stop, um, or you have for a very short period of time. Um, and not 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 even you know not a time that that is even part of the life cycle of the plants that are grown um, and so coming from mpk to this system and to looking at this kind of thing when we're talking to the farmer guys um their 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 view is that it's very complex and that the system that we currently have is is nice and simple it's mpk and and then you know it fits well with the economy because the economy is a fixed rigid rigid system um and these soft complex systems seem so complicated um and i think i think they are very complicated but obviously we know that the simple patterns within that complication that allow you to work it out and it's not it isn't rocket science so yeah one of those so again, just some stats for, for those kind of guys that, that, that love stats, but just that 1% of organic matter, um, you know, there's been multiple science, soil scientists that have come up with the same figures on that now, and we're getting the same correlation. And I know stats like this are big, and I know that that when you're talking to people and agronomists, there's a lot of ways to explain it away, but it keeps happening over and over again. That 1% could really change, you know, what's going to happen and what is happening definitely and yeah kind of that bottom one not all compost are equal but yeah adding clay and um, not only is it good for that last slide that we talked about your cations and your anions obviously uh, clay is great it's a um it's great at binding things together so that's that's kind of what we know about about uh clay but also compost that has clay added has been proven to last a minimum of 35 years. So I could make compost today with clay in and it will outlive me. A lot of compost, that's not the case. And obviously you're growing it for one season and you can see on the ground that it's pretty much dissipated and there is not much left there and you need to reapply. Whereas if we can make good composts with a little, you know, it's, I mean, it's not, it's, it's nothing, it's no mind blowing thing. It's nothing that hasn't been done before, but just by adding that clay, we can, we can make it last. But yeah, not really anything that you guys will find. I mean, that, this is the, this is the, um, this is the whole growing plan that we have got for the city of Derby and that is it. So we showed this to the council and they were like, so how are you going to do all this? How are you going to grow all this food? How are you going to make all these parks? How are you going to make everything nutritionally dense, like you say, and super food and, and health, healthy, health food and, and, you know, a medicine? How are you going to do all that? And this is all we, we hit them with. And it was just the three points. If we can create humus with the compost, we can add a mineral. So we've got a proper soil, soil profile and, you know, minerally dense food and we can add the biology, then that's it. And so, yeah, simplicity has been the key with those guys. They, they absolutely loved it. They went away and had a little look into it and realised it was just, yeah, that, that is actually all you need. So, yeah, maybe, maybe too simplistic and maybe too pragmatic, but I think it's a, it's a nice, easy one for, for anyone to start off gardening. With. As long as you've got your own organic matter and humus, you've got all your minerals and you've got your biology, you can grow healthy food that's pest resistant, that is... Uh, um, you know, avoiding all of the, pretty much all of the traps that we fall into as, as gardeners. 
Amazing. Thank you, Nev, man. I'm, uh, yeah, that was awesome. Cheers, dude. I'd like to open yeah. it up now because it's very rare to get this many amazing soil enthusiasts and compost makers and gardeners in a room together. So, yeah, if you to uh, anyone that has any burning questions, then please just like fire away. You can use the, you could just talk or unmute or, or put your hand up or however you want to play it. Um, I've got a lot I can think of, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm interested to know what your model is, Nev, like how you guys are doing it. Um, like, cause there's, have you set up a community interest company or what's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a CIC um, um, and well, one's a CIC, one is um, just a community organization, which is kind of cool really for the, for the size that it is. Um, just because of the lack of administration and stuff, it's great. Mm. Um, not that there's a lot going along with the CIC. It's 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 really simple. Um, um, and we we've got we're gonna in Derby we're gonna expand that into various CICs, and then we're gonna hopefully kind of umbrella it with something maybe a B Corp, if, depending on how we go and whether we can enterprise as much as we can socially. Um, so yeah, we're gonna see how that works out. And how did you learn everything about soil? Did you, you didn't do the Soil Food Web course, or did you? I haven't, no, I haven't. Um, I wish I had the time to do it. I'm just- Just uh, books. Just books, just reading, yeah. Reading, um, coming on things like this, to speaking to guys like yourself. Huh. Um, obviously, over the last few years, we've had so many online conferences, haven't we, that have been, I would have never got to attend them because uh, just so much going on and kids and whatever else um so yeah there's been a massive info dump the last few years it's been great there's been so much information out there but yeah books just reading books i can't stop reading books it's great are you guys planning on selling your compost um possibly at some point that all, all of the projects because they're based within the community that's ideally where where we want it to go um, but all, a lot of the people are very supportive of, of us enterprising on allotment spaces. So we might do it just for the point of it um, and it'd be a minimal, a minimal charge um, nice. just so they see that it's sort of wiping its own face, etc. Nice. We've got it. We got a question from Amy. I've got, I'd love to share a bit about the, how we can how like selling compost after, but Amy's got a hand up. Amy and Hayley. Yo, yo. We've got two questions. Um, the first question was about, go on. Oh, um, I, I was just wanting um, you to signpost me, Nev, to some books. Some books um, considering, uh, imagine, yeah, my, my knowledge is really basic at the moment. Cool, totally. Um, I'll, I can send you, I've got a reading list I can send you. Oh, Nikki, Nikki, can you take a picture of your bookshelf for us as well when... when... <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm in Dartmouth at the moment. But uh, yeah, I've got I've got also got a good uh, book list, and I put in the chat the one I've just finished called Soil by Matthew Evans, which is a fantastic book. I can highly recommend. Peter has also got uh, some amazing books, but that sounds awesome. Soil by Matthew Evans. And the second question is um, clay. We've got a lot of clay, and I can really yeah I I like it. Uh, what? How would we add it back to our compost? Yeah. Because I can see that I can see how it yeah it ends up at the bottom. And how, yeah. how do you add it back? Totally, just try and dry it. To be honest, I try and just dry it and crumble it. Yeah, I just try and cake it into thin slices if I can, as thin as possible, and then let mm. it dry it, and then make a you know a friable, friable substance. It does as soon as it's out of the earth, and even in the polytunnel, it just kind of crumbles up. And then I'm getting them down to, you know, pebble sized pieces and it's uh, mm. within, the, within the tumbling process, it's disappearing. It's and are gone. you putting, is that your mineral? Is that your mineral part, part of your mineral mix in the yeah. recipe that Tom said? Is, it, is yeah. that part of your mineral? Yeah, I just generally just use volcanic rock dust or basalt. Um, one, of the, one of those two are both a, a, a good sort of mineral, you know, the whole, all the 57. Minerals. But what about clay? Is clay not? Does clay not count as minerals when you've got it all? Yeah, all? Well, uh, uh, possibly calcium. Yeah, that's lime. right. 
Yeah, yeah. So if you go on the, can I just um, say, if everyone goes on the Soil Food Web website and looks at those, there's seven videos that are animations that are free, and there's really good one about the mineral, about the calcium cycle and the magnesium cycle, and how those two elements affect each other, and 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 yeah, active relation, and basically by adding calcium to soils, we can flocculate clays. And that is the key that builds structures into clays. So like, um, I actually had a compost, well, a compost um, member today contacting me saying they've got loads of um, oysters and mussels shells and things like that. Like, and I've learned from the soil food web stuff that we got to, um, the best thing to do with calcium, including chicken shells, uh, is to, well, you can make, you can speed up the, 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 the process of making them bio, making it bioavailable again by turning it to charcoal kind of so you, you basically put calcium fill a biscuit tin full of charcoal and put it in the fire and it uh you know that, that the chemical reaction happens and then you can feed that to biology your compost heap or even as simple as put it in apple cider vinegar and the carbon the car the co2 leaves the calcium which makes it completely bio bioavailable to plants again and then you put that in clay and then that that helps the clay structure form. So really in clay soils, yeah, calcium is an absolutely great input. And the, the, the calcium is, is called the trucker of all minerals. So the calcium pretty much makes most of other minerals available. And that's the thing with an incomplete um, mineral profile is that with a missing, just literally one or two missing, you're probably blocking out or overcompensate in, in other areas. It's the, it's the holistic nature of, of mineral cycling. Yeah. Totally. Thanks. That's good. Thank you. Um, there was, I got, a, I got a point there that was like, yeah, got a, a, that, that, that leads me somewhere else, but it's completely disappeared. Yeah. Do you want to say it? Uh, it's just disappeared. I, I can't say it if I wanted to, it's gone. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> No but yeah someone did mention a book in the chat and that was the woodchip handbook um which is by ben raskin um he's doing great work with the soil association and with uh with uh, mr tolhurst and, and and others around uh wood chip and and um and yeah it's made me it's made me think a lot it's made me think a lot and it's made me understand that if i'm going to going to get my compost and my beds and my growing areas full of of um sort of nutritional compost it's a way of backing that off because obviously too much is is, is, is bad and it's you know as bad as too little isn't it so it's it's getting to a point with your growing spaces where putting compost on constantly it, you're gonna overcompensate something whether it be phosphorus or, or something else and and getting wood chip and making that fungally dominated compost mm. the way of just literally easing off all of that nutrient stuff and making your life easier. Right.